Dile. Yeah, Tulvai, we are waiting on you. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but no, no video. Oh, wait, hold on. I, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I okay. forgot to go. click on that little thing there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, good evening again. Okay, yeah, thank you. That is. Uh, yeah, we are starting now, sir. Thank you, Leon. Dennis, take it over. Yeah, I got it. Good evening, friends and the panelists. Good evening. Today, today we welcome uh, Dr. Atul Rai. As uh, most of you know, he used to be the USACA president way early around 2000. That was the rise of the USA cricket. He did some uh, great foundation work, great initiative at the international level. And because of that ground growth level development, especially in academy side, we were able to compete in 2006 World Cup, first ever time. And don't forget, we end up at number 12 spot. Beyond that, by profession, he is a doctor and also very effective and long lasting administrators, especially in Los Angeles area. If you look at the Southern California cricket, he has been a warrior, I call it, 25 plus years with so many initiatives. And he has done everything he can to keep up with the US cricket, as well as going forward. He did win the inaugural election with the USA uh, cricket. And uh, because of the tie in his position, he has uh, only served one and a half year under the Development and Operation Committee as well. And now he is also contesting for the possible future election, which has uh, all sort of information out there. And uh, the key part is Atul is also another candidate and I'm a strong supporter for that. And we also support from the cricket show. We had him in the past few times and today we have another opportunity to bring him with the, some updates and the things uh, going in a, especially US cricket as well as the ICC level cricket. So welcome Dr. Atul Rai for today's show. And uh, we will begin before that. I like to have you a few minutes to say about yourself if I have not covered any point or any positive things about you, but you can definitely add those comments to it. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Dr. Atulwe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dr. Patel. And uh, thank you, Dennis and Leon, for having me uh, this evening. Um, it's an honor. Uh, and I don't take anything lightly when I am you know, in front of people who are uh, I would say volunteers, I mean, people like, such as yourself and Dennis and Leon, uh, you are the people who actually allow uh, someone like me to go out there and, you know, do what I need to do. So I thank you for this opportunity. Um, uh, let me, let me, uh, you, you asked if, if you say something about myself. I say to you that I'm a servant of cricket, you know, and, uh, and so many of us are, uh, we have been working for years and years and years and decades uh, for that matter. And I started in Southern California cricket, um, you know, playing cricket, you know, uh, late 80s to then eventually, um, you know, became the president of Southern California cricket. And I was there for many years as Southern California Cricket Association president. And... Um, and obviously, we have beautiful facilities in LA at Woodley Park, and we were able to actually bring in a lot of national, international tournaments to Woodley Park. And um, 
And eventually, of course, you know, I got involved, um, you know, with the national uh, USA Yusaka at that time. And I, I would say I was probably drawn into it because people, there were several people who called me and said, we need you to help, you know, put together uh, things that were required at that time. So anything that I do generally, I take it very seriously. So I... I eventually became president of Isaka in 2001. And right after I became the president, I started writing a plan for U.S. cricket because, uh, I mean, you guys may or may not know this, that U.S. cricket never had a, actually a strategic plan. And so when I wrote the plan and sent it to the ICC, I think they were really shocked. Uh, they said, is, is it true? I, they said to me, is it really a plan that you wrote? I said, absolutely. Because I said, I believe strongly that if you don't plan you always uh, fail. You know, there's a saying, right? You fail to plan, you plan to fail. So, and therefore, you know, when I, I prepared the plan, five-year strategic plan, that got the ICC thinking. Uh, and uh, of course, there were several things that we did. And one of them was starting the junior cricket initiative. As uh, the thing you might know, we started the National Junior uh, Cricket Development Program in, in eight different centers. And we started the under-19 programs and the first ever under-19 national was held in 2003 when I was soccer president. We never even had a under-19 program until then. And we, I created the national championships and we created, you know, the yes, program for the uh, senior team. And uh, in fact, uh, we won the first American championship uh, in uh, Argentina, beating Canada, which was the first time ever that we beat uh, Canada. Uh, you know, because we always lost to Canada because they were very strong. So all I'm saying is that there were a lot of different things that we needed to do to lay the foundation for U.S. cricket to forge ahead. So, and that's how we ended up in the Champions Trophy in 2005. And we qualified and, uh, well, you know, uh, people called it the golden era, but however we call it as. But as an administrator, it was important for me to lay the foundation for the success of U.S. cricket. Because the, without the foundation, you cannot get ahead. You know, you can only build castles in the air, but you don't go anywhere. Those castles can collapse. So, and that's the reason why I said, you know what, let's write a plan. Let's play the foundation. Let's move forward. So, of course, you know, I was, and I was done with U.S. soccer in 2003. And then, of course, I was still an administrator uh, with the Southern California Cricket. I was still part of the board. I was still involved with cricket. But come fast forward to uh, 2016, USA Cricket was being formed, and I was asked uh, to be part of it. And reluctantly, I agreed uh, because when I say reluctantly, I wasn't quite sure, you know, how this was going to go. And I was uh, convinced by many people that called me and said, "With your experience and knowledge, you should be part of this new organization." because this is a new U.S. cricket and there's a lot of opportunities that can come because of this and you will be helpful in making things sure that our youngsters and our seniors and women, everyone else, have an opportunity to play the game and make, go, make cricket uh, go forward. You know, so it's kind of that commercial partnership and all of the other things that they said at that time, it, it, it was attractive to me. So, and I said, yes, I would like to be part of it. Because, I, I mean, as previously when I was part of USACA, and I had done many things with international bodies and about going to that meeting. In fact, we hosted the um, international game in LA, the India A versus Australia A, five-match series. That was the first ever that we ever um, organized. So with all that experience, and I was told that we, I needed to be part of it. That's the main reason why I contested. And uh, uh, of course, I shared the term with another gentleman. And, but my time in U.S. cricket for the first part of it, I think was quite fruitful in my opinion. I did a lot of different things. So uh, I, I, I believe that I gave it a lot and gave it everything that I had. And uh, of course, my term ended uh, in uh, May of 2020 and just after COVID had started. I can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, uh, yeah. For, for the listeners and panelists, we have Dr. Ratul Rai, former USAGA president, as well as a former USA cricket administrator. 
and is running for the re-election when our administrative people can uh, actually do it. But uh, let's stick with the positive things, being involved in this administration for a long time. I'd like to ask you a one quick question here. Is a radio show used to be all about West Indies cricket and eventually as per the ICC, we have to heavily rely on West Indies because they are just right in our neighborhood and they are uh, exist since uh, 1928 in international cricket and they had a huge run in 80s and 90s where they be a Mount Everest for any team to beat them during that prime time. And the lately, they have more issues than we have in US about uh, what I read, let's say. But the uh, thing is going back is how you feel in terms of relying on West Indies for the development in US. No doubt one thing is very clear, our minor league and major league will all give them the huge opportunity, including coaching and empiring, I will say that a lot of West Indies players and coaches and empires can have potential opportunities with the ventures which is developing in the US. And uh, everyone feels like we're gonna have more people coming from West Indies to benefit. But on the other side, the way I look at it is, it will benefit our local cricket because we don't have up to that standard. And we are playing with those players. We are playing under those coaches who are coming from West Indies that can improve our future. But my key question is here in short is, playing is a different thing on the field. On the sideline is a different thing, but there is a huge remote control goes to the administration and management, let's say. And by the way, cricket never fail in US. If you ask anybody, it's more of an administrative failures, time to time, different plan, different administration, different thought process, different budget, and that brings a different uh, crisis for us. So in that terms, i like to have a word from you. What do you think about forging, let's say, good partnership with West Indies first and syncing or linking with the other cricket association around the world and make this USA one of the greatest country for cricket? Yeah, thank you. You hit the uh, nail on his head, I think. Uh... Uh, that in. Um, we are an associate member of the ICC, as you know, and the ICC's requirement is that uh, we should work with the full members in the region for our development of our issues or whatever it is that we need to um, get help for. For example, I'll give an example. Uh, Kenya is an associate member of the ICC, and when they had problems, South Africa helped them because they're the full member. So I believe the West Indies have a significant role to play in, in what USA cricket does. But because USA is a huge market and the, the dynamics and the magnitude of USA cricket is so big that it's a symbiotic relationship. Each of us have to gain from the other, right? So you said it very nicely. We have always had great cricket in the US. But the administration has been a problem, you know, over the years. And so I was working, when I was part of ISAC, I was working with uh, Reverend Rezal, who was the president at that time. Phenomenal uh, relationship. And I, I think the things that we did together was quite amazing. It was, I really had a lot, I have a lot of respect for Reverend uh, Rezal. And um, he was all for developing the game. And that's how uh, ICC was able to put together Project USA at that time, which would have brought millions of dollars. Anyway, um, so coming down to the other nitty gritty. So we, as an associate member, have limited resources and limited, limited access to coaches or umpires or other programs or knowledge base or really even uh, technically skilled people, right? So I think relying on Western Indies Cricket Board is so important. Actually, that's why the relationship has to be uh, at, you know, critical. I mean, it's, it's a critical relationship that we have to have with the Western Indies Cricket Board. And so I think it was a bit underutilized. It is the administration, whether here or there, 
hasn't really connected. And I think the current president has done a wonderful job. I should say that because I met him a few times and he has come. He actually extended his hand many, many times. And if we didn't utilize it, it's not their fault. In the past, it may have been uh, to an extent, I would say. The Western Board didn't do enough, you know, I could say that I mean, at some at some point. Because there were different administrations in the in, in the Western Indies. But at, at least the current administration, I know they've extended their hand. So if we didn't utilize it, it won't be their fault. So I certainly believe that we have a lot to gain from being forging a partnership with the Western Indies Board. Uh, on the next topic is we have a lot of uh, progressive or positive movement, the momentum, like India, West Indies, T20, twice in US. Then uh, we had about three years for CPL came out and played in Florida, only one location so far. And then uh, they backed out. And because of Corona, we don't have any game. And at the same time, there was a positive movement uh, made from the US and Canada administrators. Like uh, first it was like a ICC Americas combined, which was used to be a player from let's say Canada, America, Bermuda, Suriname, something. They wanted to bring a combination of the team just like the West Indies, which is built on 42 CARICOM countries, majority of them the islands, and then we had opportunity to compete in West Indies, but then we had opportunity to be part of the CPL, let's say only one player for each team or something, it was supposed to be drafted under the auctions. And now it's a demissing and there is a outcry both way, I will say. In the West Indies, the fan thinks like the USA is taking advantage of the CPL by sending USA players. And then they also sometimes think like the USA is trying to recruit players through that event from West Indies. It actually, it's not. If you look at it, the current spinner is played for the USA that he went back and now he's a star in West Indies, you know? So West Indies has a dual opportunity, but my key concern is here, let's say you're running for election, what is the future plan to forge this partnership as a concrete and bring more CPL game to US, I will say more West Indies uh, influence in US cricket, as well as opportunities for all of us from the US side to be in a Caribbean. And that is the win-win solution. And uh, the biggest thing what I read or what I hear from different people, it was a administrative issue because I have seen players playing well, coaches working well, administration is the one. So what do you think that the future administration has to do to make this thing win-win, which can help both the West Indies on the money side, as we can speak, and at the same time, we need to improve our standard in international cricket. So well, what's your thought, I would say, in your opinion? I'm not looking at plan. It's a long way to go. But what are the ideas you may have to make this thing possible? The simplest thing, uh, Jatin, is, uh, you know, I always say that let the players play the game, right? So remove the roadblocks, you know, and we have no business. If I'm an administrator, I have no business to stop people from playing where they want to play. And so whether U.S. players want to play in the Caribbean, the Caribbean players want to play in the U.S., there should be no hindrance. We are neighbors. Beyond everything else, the fact that they're full members, uh, and then beyond that, we are neighbors. And there are so many players uh, from the Caribbean that play in different leagues, right? And different, different tournaments and... So it has enriched U.S. cricket tremendously over the years. So there is absolutely no reason for us to uh, prevent the, the, the players, the Caribbean players, from playing here. And the CPL is a good example of how the local uh, the 20 T20s have mushroomed over a period of time. Because look at the, the quality, right? The players that play in the Caribbean. So that kind of quality, you don't get in the associate membership because we are not there yet. So we definitely will gain from such a uh, relationship, such a transfer of uh, you know, teams and uh, uh, players playing 
in our local tournament. So more CPL games in the US, absolutely, we will have uh, more to gain from, you know, and I watched several of them uh, a couple of years ago and I was there and a different level of the game. And we know this, whether it's uh, CPL, IPL, uh, BSL, whatever they are, the level of the game is far above we play at the local level. So our players will definitely gain from it. So don't stop those things. Don't prevent people from playing. Get, remove the roadblock. That's what I would say. And last question on this topic while we're moving forward and uh, looks like the USA Cricket's agenda through the Asian Willow is to launch a major league by 2024 as far as the last update then there's a lot of fear and worries going on, both sides, West Indies, as well as in the US. What happens if this major league take place, like the IPL, because at the moment we have more Indian people involved in this administration. And uh, by the way, they look at our officials, I will say, and then also at the ace and below side, the owners, and the top of that, if you look at the current uh, list of owners in a minor league, majority of them, the Indians. So there is a, as I said, fear and worry ongoing. What will happen? Is it something BCCI can break the ice and send their players first time to play in US? That, that is the kind of rumor going on, like they, the BCCI put their hands on US cricket and this can be a, another uh, big hit like the IPL, but at the same time, the real concern is what happens to our local cricketers who are coming up from local leagues and the youth level is a local academies. So just give us a thought on that one before I pass this thing to Dennis, he might have a couple of questions, but I like to see what we can anticipate about this major league, if they join hands with the, let's say, BCCI, because that's uh, everyone feels there is coming, I will say, directly or indirect. And if they stab shame, it's all about USA market. Um, you know, I always believe that you can grow and build a whole big, big structure with a proper foundation, right? So major league cricket is a major structure that they're trying to build. I'm not against it, but then again, I want to see how we're going to support major league cricket in the future. Because at this point, I believe we really don't have a serious plan to grow the game. And if we don't have great opportunities for our young players, to actually play the game, then we are all wasting time. Major League Cricket, importing players. I mean, again, yes, bring players, that's fine. Major League Cricket wants to do it. Yeah, you know, I, I support uh, the, you know, their ventures and all of that, but it can't be at the expense of US Cricket because at the, at the current time, I certainly believe that we don't have a real plan. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, really we need to develop our local players in order for us to actually grow the game. And that's one of the main reasons, a you know, part of my agenda in my election, is that we need to have some community-based programs to develop the core of our uh, players. And so that we can have, a, at a national level, abundance of players for the future. Right? And uh, we can have professional players come and go. But what happens to the base? Our foundation is still weak. And, and look at the under-19 players. Over the years, uh, you know this, that so many of those players played until they went to college. Guess what happens when they turn 18? What, does the, what do the parents say? Sorry, you don't have an opportunity to play anymore because you're wasting time. Go to college and get a degree and get a, get a job. Why can't we create that opportunity for these players to continue to play the game? So what I'm trying to recommend to these people is create scholarships in universities, right? In un colleges and universities should have scholarships for these kids from when they turn 18 to go to colleges so they can continue to play the game. When our under-19 team finishes their, uh, their term and uh, turn playing, create the A-team, USA National A-team. 
A team should continue to play, right? So that's the bench strength. If you don't have the bench strength, how are you going to ever support the national team? You know, so there's so many different things that I can tell you. But you know what? I can see that's of my vision, right? And I, I can see this from my mile ahead. So, and that's my strength. And that's why I kind of sometimes feel frustrated that this isn't, this isn't, hasn't happened. I would like to make it happen, right? So we, we have to grow the game at the grassroots level. We can't just rely on all these players coming from elsewhere, right? I mean, again, nothing against those players. I, I, I good players are coming and playing. If I'm not against it, but we need our local hero. We need uh, our brand, Laura, growing up in the U.S. We need a local Sachin Tendulkar, or we need a local Ricky Ponting. We don't want another Ricky Ponting who's imported from somewhere, and that's not a local hero, right? For me, a local hero is somebody who came up from our ranks within our U.S. Thank you. For the fans, again, we have Dr. Atul Rai, former USACA president as well as the USAC administrator. And uh, he is being involved in the US cricket for 25 years, I will say. That's the uh, time I know him. And we can keep continuing on this, but before uh, I switch it to the Dennis, we like to keep our uh, uh, conversation with the Dr. Rathulai specifically on two front. It's all about USA cricket and what we can do in terms of the positive progress means development and at the same time we like to have his uh, ideas and opinion because he is uh, contesting the election so what we can anticipate from him with that point i like to have a dennis to go on and ask few questions yeah dr Wright, welcome to the cricket show and i want to take this opportunity to thank you for your contribution to the development of cricket here, not only just in the uh, Southern California region, but also in the USA. Now, Thank you. I know you have been previously a member of the USACA board, which would effectively we're saying you've been part of USA cricket for a long time. Are you currently a member of the board at this moment? No, I'm not. Uh, my term ended in uh, May of uh, 2020. That was the last time I was uh, a member. I was a member of the board from August 2018 uh, to May of 2020. Mm -hmm. Not, I'm not All a member right. anymore so right now. I also under right. I understand that you're campaigning for a seat on the board. What position are you seeking currently on the board? So currently, the, the election that is due, uh, this was due in uh, 2020, by the way, this election has been delayed since 2020. So that election is for two positions. Um, I'm saying actually there are three positions on the board. The uh, club director is one of them, which is what I'm contesting for. There's another position, the individual director position. And then the third one is the female player uh, director position. So the, for the female director position, there was no competition. Uh, there was only one candidate. But for my position, club director position, there are other contestants. So I'm running as a candidate, and I'll be nominated to be contesting in that election for the club director position. Thank you. So you mentioned earlier on uh, the development of the game here in the United States. Now, I... I saw that the current chairman of the USA Cricket reported that a membership drive in 2021 successfully increased the number of membership by to approximately 20,000. So this is an increase of what, over 12,000 members. Is that considered part of the development strategy well, uh, let me take you back, you know, uh, in 2018 uh, was the first time we had a membership drive. So it was a bit of a chaotic in a way. Uh, however, there are about seven to 8,000 people who have to register because it was the first time. And we, in fact, a lot of us actually uh, communicated to different leagues and memberships and, you know, trying to drive the membership off. 
Now, as we all know, uh, at the local level, there's a certain amount of apathy towards what happens at the national level because of the lack of communication, uh, lack of uh, value, um, you know, perceived value for membership. And not knowing what really that means to a member. So some of us who have been around had to actually literally drive that membership to where we had about 17,000 people the first time ever. And out of which a certain percentage voted in the elections and there was an election that happened, about 5,000 or whatever, or 3,000 ago. And unfortunately, there was no continued communication from USA Cricket to, to these members to continue that drive to increase membership. So, uh, and I kept uh, mentioning to the chairman at that time, I remember talking to the chairman of the board that end of that year, beginning of 2019, I said to the chairman, Mr. Chairman, we are in trouble because we haven't done, made, sent any communication to the membership. How are we going to conduct elections every year if we don't have members? So he asked me to actually you know, spearhead that, uh, suddenly he gave it to me and said, go ahead and spearhead the committee and then start this membership, you know, come up with an idea or some, uh, some, some, some way to actually do it. So I called for a meeting, you know, a few of some members and, you know, put a panel together, which was um, Eric Parkins, I believe, was the, was the project uh, manager at that time. And I said, let's just uh, have a way to actually um, have a membership drive. So, and after a lot of back and forth, uh, within a, a few weeks, I think we had several meetings and uh, we came up with the idea that we will have uh, a ten dollar membership uh, per ten dollar fee per member, and that would include the insurance uh, for USA Cricket. So, and uh, yeah, of course, the the, the the project manager wanted to charge fifty dollars, and we had to fight to keep that to ten dollars. Uh, but unfortunately, after the board accepted it, and we were supposed to send that information to the membership, it was never communicated. So come uh, July, August, uh, when they opened up the membership, uh, by then, uh, the membership uh, the, had already signed on to the local insurances and all that. And no one had wanted to sign up for U.S. cricket because that $10 meant nothing at that time, the insurance benefit. So we only had 800 people who actually finally signed up. And uh, so we had an election in 2019 with only 800 people. So, and, uh, so I was disappointed because I said, with all of the effort that we make, if the, the administration doesn't communicate, you know, the U.S. cricket looks bad. We're all looking bad because somebody failed to do the job. So come end of the year, I said to the chairman, I said, this is not right. So we need to actually continue to drive the membership. And he uh, said to me, uh, by then, the new CEO had taken office. Mr. Higgins, and he said to me, what is your idea? So I said to him, why reinvent the wheel? There are a lot of very big leagues in this country who have already have uh, the database. They have members. Why don't you go to them and ask them for their database? Tell them, tell them we want to make them all your members, members of USA Cricket. So then you have a large database that you can work with. That's how you want to do it. Don't reinvent the wheel. So come January of 2021, uh, 2020, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Higgins actually started communicating with uh, all of the leagues. So uh, sure enough, he had about 60, 70 leagues that were communicating with him. And the, suddenly the number swelled to like 15,000 to 20,000 was the number he was quoting. And that all happened because we connected with those leagues. And I was on those calls with all the league presidents because I knew most of them. And I was trying to help make this happen. Unfortunately, sometime in uh, April, I think, once COVID happened, uh, we didn't continue with that initiative. My term ended in May, and I think the ball was dropped, and we didn't do anything with the membership. And so that 20,000 number, you know, we didn't know where it was. And then they, the whole election process or the membership drive was relayed all the way until January of 2020. And then they restarted the whole process. Um, I was 
kind of be disappointed, to be honest, because if USA uh, uh, can have general election with 150 million people voting in the middle of COVID, why can't USA cricket have 15,000 people vote online and have a membership in election? So the COVID is an excuse was not uh, something I would accept. So, however, uh, here we are, right? So 2021, they restarted the membership and then by, they said the deadline was March 15th of 2021. So we again went back to all these people because we love USA Cricket. We want to make sure USA Cricket thrives. We went back to all these people and said, please become members. So we draw the membership and I believe at that time, the CEO said we have about 15,000 people. And unfortunately, we never uh, again found out who are the people who are registered because from March 15th, we never heard anything from USA Cricket as we, the data was never published. And so, and no one knew as to what would happen next. And the USA Cricket, they waited until August of 2021 to ask these people to pay for their membership. And half of them didn't pay because they said, wait, this was in January and we are in August. What happened between January and August, right? So the lack of uh, continuity, the lack of uh, follow-ups and a lack of communication really helped the effectiveness. And, uh, and if there are members today if, if, if in USA Cricket, it's not because of what USA Cricket did. It's because what people did at the ground level, right? And so uh, to what Jatin had said in the beginning, USA Cricket continues to thrive because of people who work at the ground level, not because what people do at the top. And it's, it's, I'm sorry to say this, the administration has failed repeatedly. You know, and we all look bad because I'm an administrator. I look bad too. And I'm, I'm not willing to take the blame for it because I, am, I want to let people know that we try very hard and we are very passionate about it. We want to give people back what they deserve, right? So the three things that are on my agenda when I get out of the board, bring transparency and accountability to the board, number one, right? Bridge the gap between the board and the members. Bridge that gap. That is, that is a huge gap, right? And bring value-added membership to these people. If there is no value, why would I become a member? Nobody wants to become a member because I don't see value. So I want those three major items on the agenda for me for the board, right? When I get to the board, that's what I want to say. So hopefully I will, but anyway. Does that answer your question, sir? Right, well, thank you for 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 um, the information. You mentioned at will the cooperation between the, C the United States involving the CPL. Now, what I want to know previously, CPL had reserve slots for players, say, from the United States. Now, recently, I understood that. The CPL is putting forward a recommendation to remove that reserve spot for United States players. What's your thought on that? I don't think it is good for the game, uh, to, especially if you want to grow the game in the United States. And we all know that US is the, the biggest market in the world. You know, there's, it's undisputable at this point. So if you really want the cricket, the CPL to grow, and I think CPL will, will need USA as a partner. So and I think having the players from the US, their reserve is a good thing. And again, I can understand from the business point of view, that some of those people might say, oh, you know what, maybe it doesn't make dollars and cents. Because dollars and cents itself doesn't always drive the game always. Uh, you know, would that, otherwise test cricket wouldn't be here, right? So, and therefore, I think it's important for these people to understand, have a futuristic thinking, you know, think about what your vision is for the future. If CPL has to grow, it, we need to USA to work together with the West Indies board and the CPL so that we can then have all these people playing in the Caribbean. So it benefits mutual. So I certainly believe that there should be some uh, players reserved from US for in the CPL. 
Yeah, thank you. But uh, coach, I have one more question and then regrettably right. I have to, um, you know, leave. So one more question for you and that is, you mentioned that you believe scholarship is one way forward. The thing about scholarship, if the game is not played competitively within schools and colleges, how will a scholarship um, implementation work to develop the game here in the United States? Well, first of all, uh, the scholarship is for a student to get into the college. Uh, so you, you, when you apply for schools and colleges, uh, universities, you know, if there is no scholarship, then the student has to pay the entire tuition. And so the scholarship helps for students to get into the college, number one. Secondly, it's a recognition of the game. Uh, you know, Hereford College, for that matter, as you probably know, as a program, is one of the only colleges in the big, in, from years ago, is the only one that actually had a program and a successful program at that. And similarly, why can't we duplicate that model and have it in other colleges? And so we have to start somewhere and then grow that uh, program. And so the competitive program you're talking about will be where once you have, you know, currently there are uh, there is American college cricket and there are others who run college cricket, but that's not at, recognized at the university level, the college level. We want the colleges to actually run a program. It doesn't have to be a varsity, varsity program. It has, it has to be, could be, uh, you know, uh, a inter college uh, at a lower level and not the NCAA kind of stuff, right? Because that's a huge deal. So, but there can be other yeah. programs that can be run because we definitely need to continue to allow these kids to play, right? Otherwise they drop off and then, then we don't have the talent anymore. I can add something here, Dennis, for more knowledge on NCAA side. I'm being involved for 28 years now, high school and college. Only thing I can say, cricket can make it, but you cannot control it. There is a big challenge. This scholarship is the one way. It doesn't mean you need to offer this scholarship for 560 universities in this country. No. First thing first, if you look at these existing two programs, if I read right, there's a two different people, two different organizations is running American college cricket. That means we have enough colleges, whatever the way they are playing, but the colleges are on board. Some of the college teams are getting some funding from the college and university, including their grounds and other stuff, is coming as extracurricular activities. So the step one, I presented this thing to ICC Americas too, six years back. Your step one is simple. Why don't you give the scholarship to the colleges and university who already has recreational team? Let's take it this way. Yeah. Once the money is going in college, means yeah. college got the income. They already paid the money from their extracurricular budget for the international student, let's say, for the foreign activities. Feeding them this money means they will support you to promote more this game. And then you start feeding the money to the developing players. I'm talking undergraduate players who are doing well. You expect they can be a USA cricketer in let's say three, five years down the road. Why don't we support? Just like every other game out there. Once you achieve that, and once the administration wants to cross that bridge and do well, then there is a possibility. It is not a overnight solution to make a NCAA cricket. No, there's a long way to go. Step one, you got to have the officially approved intramural sport, which does not exist right now. Once you do that, then you might step into the NCAA Division three teams, then NCAA Division two teams. I say it's a long route, but the seeding need to be start with the scholarship. Otherwise, we're going nowhere. Can I, let me add uh, one more thing. That, uh, that is, I, when I was on the board, I was a cricket committee chair. And, um, and this is one thing I actually proposed to the board. And uh, we actually approached several colleges. The one of the things that we did, you know, which you might find interesting, 
that we went to these universities and found out who are the donors who had links to cricket. Right? So if you somebody is already donating fifty hundred million dollars, I would go to that person and say, hey, make sure when you donate that money next time, and you know tell them that this at least at least half of it should be set aside for cricket scholarship. Guess what? Now we have a significant amount of money dedicated in the college, and the college can't say no to you for cricket. So and that's our that was our approach to start off. And of course, we are not going to be able to uh, you know enlist all the colleges universities in this country. But we wanted to start somewhere. We actually approached quite a few colleges, including Princeton, and uh, and and we made some progress. Uh, of course, you know I left the board and I had no idea what ever happened to that because you know anything every initiative that you start, somebody has to continue on. Right. So, anyway, just just my two cents there. So, thanks, Dennis. Well, thank you, you so much, Dr. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Rai. I have I have to leave, but I do appreciate it, and I look forward to you being able to come back another time to fill us in with what's developing as things move along. Thank you once again, the doctor, and uh, JT and Coach JT. And I will speak to you again soon. And Leon. They show the Leon, floor you are on the next one now. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Let's hey, see what the Leon has. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, Doc. Good Welcome evening, to yeah. the show. You're no stranger to us. <laughs> I hope um, you'll be back again. But firstly, yeah. let me say you, the USA has gotten some problems with regard to elections and the shades of Yusaka. And I understand that you were trying to intervene. Can you tell us if you have gotten any way with you were trying to intervene so that the election should go forward? Uh, are you uh, referring to the current elections, uh, Leon? Yes. Yeah. Leon. Uh, mm -hmm. So essentially, I wrote to the board. And uh, because I wrote to, of course, I, the chairman, uh, you know, when I left the board, the chairman said to, uh, during the last meeting, said to the board and to me that uh, you are way too experienced and valuable to walk away. We would like to utilize your experience and uh, knowledge uh, because of everything that I've done during my term. And uh, he said to the board that I would, he would be our advisor. And uh, I said, I'll be ha happy to because my goal is to help you as figure. And of course, we had a few conversations uh, after that. And that conversation tapered off, uh, you know, after a few months, and I never had any, you know, I never, so no one ever approached me. So, and uh, sometime in November, I wrote to the chairman and I said to him, I've been talk telling you about the membership drives and the delays, and, and we have promised to the membership that we'll, we'll get back on track, you know, once the CEO, new CEO comes in. And I don't see that happening. It's disturbing to me that. We continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. And, uh, you know, and then coming up with uh, some excuses and apologies. And, and membership will never uh, condone those things. You know, you, you can say it once, twice, and then they finally, they say, forget it. I don't want to be a member anymore. So that part, that is the part that really bothered me. And so I wrote to the chairman. I said, we need to do something about it. And the chairman said, let's get on the phone and talk. And I had a long chat with him. And then he said, no, he had, you know, this COVID issue or whatever the issue is. And so I said to him, no, because no one is going out to cast a ballot or pay membership in the mailbox. It's all done online. It would not take more than a simple email to membership to continue. And anybody could have done it. If you had interested me with the job, I would have got it done for years. Mm -hmm. However, water under the bridge, but let's move forward and let's get it done. He said, yes, it's going to happen. And then, then the membership was announced. And come March, they had the membership drive uh, by March 15th or whatever. And then they also had the nominations uh, at the same time. So I said to the chairman, generally, when you call for election, the membership drive is completed. The membership data is about published. Then you call for nominations. So the nominees know who the electorate are. You don't, yeah, we don't know what the electorate looks like. And so we mm -hmm. had nominations uh, uh, done, completed, and a list of nominees. And we had no idea who the, who the membership uh, were. The, we, the electorate was ever announced. So, and I said to the chairman, this is not acceptable. 
So Chairman Fed sent me a message saying it will be announced shortly. And that was in April of 2021. Okay. So, and that membership data was never announced until a few days ago, a few weeks ago. So then imagine the frustration people feel. Now, if me as an administrator and who has been on the board cannot get a proper answer from, for the, from these people, then think about the, the late membership that you know try, struggling to find out what really is going on and that leads to apathy that leads to people saying no i don't see me being a member of us cricket because i don't see value in it. you know and of course the pride of you know being a us cricket fan is what drives some people they don't really want anything they want us cricket to do well you know but it's very disturbing to a lot of people that we cannot take two steps forward without stumbling someone, right? And that's the part that disturbs me as well. And that's why I, I want to get onto the board and tell these people, stop, you know, uh, making excuses. Let's get the communications well. Let's give some value to people for their membership. And, you know, let's bring some accountability, uh, you know, and transparency to the, mem to the board. Because there's a disconnect there is mistrust, right? Even if I do something right and I don't tell the membership what I'm doing and why I'm doing and how, and all of the transparency, the accountability in terms of whether it's financial or otherwise, those are the important things that need, the board needs to do because we are a nonprofit organization, US Security, whether we like it or not. We are governed by the laws of, of the laws of the land and the laws of the internal revenue service as well. So we can't fool ourselves. And so anyway, uh, I'll stop here, but then I wanted to kind of give you a further perspective where, why that the, the fight is. Yeah. Okay. And uh, have you gotten any response or anything positive from those members who are uh, taking the USA to court? Are you? Uh, not really. Uh, in fact, um, I, I, what I'm hearing again is that um, in my communication, is that it is frustrating to some of those people as well that, uh, you know, the, on the board, there is never a consistent uh, policy of how they move, drive things forward. And I think from, from what I gathered, from what I've read in, you know, and on the communication that I've seen, is that, that the, the resolution that was passed, uh, or so-called resolution that was sent out to the membership, was sent out in November. And well, the election was supposed to happen in September. If you want to have an election in September, October, you want to have the resolution sent out in June or July. You don't mm -hmm. wait until November to send the resolution, right? And, and then they claim that the resolution had passed without actually providing any validity to it. The contribution requires 67%, and they said 51% is what they got. So those are the issues where the, the legal uh, battle was. And, and it's still going on from what I heard. And so we just put for your trigger. You know, and that's the transparency and accountability I talk about, right? So, because you can poo poo them, you can say, I don't care. But at the end of the day, you have to care. You are the national body. You know, there's no, nothing beyond you. Then next one is the ICC, right? So, or the Western Cricket Board. And so you, you don't want to get the Western Cricket Board uh, ICC involved every time you have a problem. I think they're also tired of it to an extent. Mm -hmm. yeah, if, if when this thing is all settled, and you were elected to be an officer, what would be your primary concern coming into running the uh, USA cricket? For instance, I take for instance, we see a number of retired players from around the world are trying to apply their trade here. And we don't, in my view, I don't see a lot of emphasis is put on trying to build youth teach them the, the game so that they can be involved and we produce our own cricketers. What say you? You know, uh, I, I prepared a vision statement um, for the election, right? My vision is actually to make cricket a mainstream sport, you know, mm -hmm. in the US. And that can only happen if we go the game at the grassroots level. And it, there has to be a community-based program, and we need to allow the youth and the, the boys and girls in this country to play the game. And I don't see a, a serious initiative 
that U.S. attention has done in that regard. We talked about it many, many times, but I don't see that happening. Uh, like I said earlier, I have nothing against uh, you know professionals coming into this country. It happens in every country, and it's okay. However, it's only it can only add value if we have a proper program mm -hmm. for our youth, mm -hmm. for our youngsters. Other than that. We are only, uh, you know, wasting our time trying to, you know, bring people from outside, and then they leave, or they, they they're getting old, and then we don't have anything, you know. Exactly. Our our, our bucket is empty here, right? <laughs> yeah. They gotta pay you money. Yes. But that's, so, that's Leon, I can, I can, Leon, I can mm -hmm. add that to that one thing. Funny with the way I hear from uh, different places because I go coaching all over places in the US. And right now we got to understand their feelings, why they mm -hmm. are getting exhausted. So I read just one good comment last weekend in San Francisco, I was coaching there for one academy. And this one gentleman came out and told me, how this is gonna help the US cricket if they are bringing these players on a contract Mm -hmm. They are the okay, one working with the money. academies, and academies are okay, paying their salary. And mm -hmm. then I will say it doesn't make sense to me because they are getting this player on a contract, but in other words, they are putting in a job at your academy cost, and within three years, he'll be eligible to play for USA, not your kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that yeah, is the, what we about... expect from the board members to see what we are exactly trying to do with our mm -hmm. youth cricket development and how it can benefit to it. It's making the school cricket is important, but in yeah. this country, it's all about, we have to rely on sources, the local sources. Yeah. Let me just quickly this, okay. this is part of my nine objectives that I, I have, you know, uh, when I was, I was writing things down, because I'm all about writing a plan. I always write things down and, and, know, and I want to know what I'm going to do, how I'm going to accomplish something. Now, I, this is what I've said to people previously as well, before the election. And whenever I meet people and I, you know, on some stage, I always say that USA is a big country. We have a lot of people who play the game at a, at a lower level, the higher level, the kids playing, the coaches, such as Stephen, and, uh, and people who work so hard. And and they don't really get compensated enough, right? But they do work hard. Why? Because they're passionate. They want to give something back to the game. And so now, if you were to really compensate all these people, $100 million won't be enough. Yeah. So let's not worry about how much money we get from the ICC or whoever else, okay? Let's try to help these people at the local level. Help the local volunteers, right? So decentralize this. This whole structure that we talk about, right? Let's give the zone, create the eight zonal structures and give these people power, empower them. So once you empower these people, guess what? Now we have a band of people working at the lower grassroots level who are willing to take that move for, movement forward. Now you have youth playing at a lower level and they have enough resources. Provide them enough resources. Bring corporate America to these people and show them the way and help these people grow the game. And then you have mm -hmm. a large exactly. pool. Yeah, so the, you know, the structure doesn't start at the top, it starts at the foundation. Bottom, bottom. Chetin, we, we do have Audley and he's they waiting to ask question, a question. Quick, they can ask quick question, that's okay. So let's go one at a time. Audley, you're on. What well, we seem to be dumb on us. <laughs> okay, let me see if um, Simon is on. I'm in Sorry. Okay, okay, he's in now. He's in now. Come on in, Audley. Mm. I'm here in the studio well. Yeah, I don't think mm. but, but, but you can hear oddly, don't you? Can you a little? No, I can uh, barely. I, I, can, I can. I can barely hear him too. Right, I'm here. I'm, I'm hearing you fine. 
and um, you're, you're, you're very low, oddly. So that, that's okay, Leon. This is uh, more than hour we took for the Dr. Latul Rai today. And, yeah, okay, good. Okay, good. As uh, we, he is uh, not a person hard to find. We always mm -hmm. love to come on show and talk about it. And uh, we will definitely have him back before the election schedule, let's say. It's uh, not oh, sure. uh, it's something uh, we can need to drag on to it right now. And we can definitely look forward for his next visit with the more questions. And we can mm -hmm. give the opportunity to other panelists to come out and uh, uh, asking questions to him to get more understanding about the USA cricket. But uh, at the moment, for time being, I will say, doctor, thanks for coming out today it's for your precious time. You took about almost hour for us today and answering almost uh, what we love to hear or what our fans love to hear. And uh, this is the first time we are doing audio video all together. So we're gonna release the both clips soon. But again, thanks for coming out. And I like to have the conclusive statement if you have anything to make before you leave the show. Yeah, thank you, Jatin. Thank you, Leon. And thanks, uh, please thank Dennis also. Uh, you know, I love to talk about um, the issues that plague cricket in this country. And uh, a lot of people talk about the potential of US cricket. What really is the potential, right? I see that I, I, I believe the potential is the people. The people who actually play, play cricket at the lower level, the, at the uh, you know, club level, or the coaches, or the, the, the little people that actually run around, do things for cricket, they are the, 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 the huge potential that we have. No one has ever uh, actually uh, you know, taken them seriously. That's why I talk about empowering them. So in order for US cricket to move forward, we need to actually give these people the authority to have to move for forge cricket ahead. So US cricket has to do a lot of work still to you know to grow the game. So I would say my sincere uh, thing to everyone would be, you know, don't lose hope. Uh, to because cricket will be, cricket happens not because of somebody at the top paid a million dollars to somebody. It happened because some boys and girls played the game on, on, on the field today. A, a coach coached the, the players. And I'll give you an example of Compton, uh, you know, cricket. Mustafa Khan coaches these kids. Mustafa Khan was a pro basketballer who knew nothing about cricket. And he coaches these kids out of passion for the game. Year, weekend after weekend after weekend, when there is nobody there, he'll go there and bring those kids and, you know, to find ways to find uniforms for them, kits for them. And who is paying him? Nobody. Let's find more such people and empower them, help them, yes, and, and 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 actually guide corporate America to go to them and help these people, and put your dollar where it is worth, and don't spend money on things which doesn't yield anything for U.S. cricket. And I I want to grow it from the bottom up, not from the top down. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I will Thank you for coming out to uh, again today. It. Yeah, thank you for coming thank out. You, thank you, so much, thank you so much, Thank you. We hope you will see you soon on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy to be here. Thank you. Same to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, good night, Doc. See you again. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Well, folks, you have heard it. Um, those we were not able.